Good morning, Port Israel. It's good to be with you today. Um, we've been in a series called Becoming, which has been about the Sermon on the Mount from Matthew 5. And some of Jesus' main points in the sermon were the Beatitudes, the part of the sermon where Jesus says, blessed are those who, blessed are those who, blessed. Put up your hand if you just want to walk in the blessings of God. <laughs> I know I do. And with that in mind, there's something really important we need to understand about the Beatitudes. They're not character traits that we can achieve by ourselves. We, we need the help of the Holy Spirit. It's, not, it's as we are in a deep, meaningful relationship with Jesus that over time he forms us to have these things so that we can be pure of heart or walk in humility and have mercy and have a hunger and thirst for righteousness. So it's the work of Jesus in us, forming us into his image. And then he says, blessed are they. I kind of get the image of, you know, how the father created the world and he stepped back and after each thing he says, it is good, it is good, it is good. And I feel like as Jesus is transforming us into his image, he looks over and says, wow, they are blessed. Um, so if you'd like to learn more about the Beatitudes, Matthew Chandler does an amazing series on Right Now Media, and it's worth checking out. But today we're going to cover Becoming Righteous, and it's from Matthew 5 verse 6. Um, so can we just read the first part of the verse together on the screen? The first part of the verse... Uh, Amen. So point one today is blessed are the hungry and the thirsty. I don't know about you, but hunger and thirst doesn't bring out the best in me. We don't usually think of hunger and thirst as being a blessing. Um, I struggle, and it's something I'm working on, with getting hangry, which if you don't know that term, it means the anger one feels when one's hungry. <laughs> and... Um, but actually, hunger and thirst are a tremendous blessing because God created our bodies to have hunger and thirst as a warning signal to, for you to go and search out nutrition and hydration for your body. Can you imagine how our body would suffer if we didn't get those warning signals of hunger and thirst? Our bodies might just fade away. And in fact, um, a decrease in appetite is a symptom of being sick. And so hunger and thirst are a tremendous blessing because they help keep us alive. Amen? But when Jesus wrote this scripture or preached this scripture, he was talking about so much more than a physical appetite. He was talking about a spiritual appetite. It was what these people were hungering for that would make them blessed. And so let's read it again, the first part of the verse again. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. So um, righteousness, there are two kinds of righteousness that we need to understand. There's the legal kind of righteousness referring to right standing with God. Have you heard that definition before? Yes, right standing with God. Then there's a relational righteousness referring to being in right relationship with God and with man. Okay, I don't know about you, but when I hear the word righteousness, I used to really get intimidated because I was thinking, I know how flawed I am. How can I ever be considered righteous? And maybe that's you too today. Maybe you're wondering, how can I, with my mistakes, ever be considered righteous? But in the scripture, Jesus is not talking about people who are already righteous. He's not talking about people who have got it together. He's talking about people who are flawed human beings that know they messed up and they have a hunger and a thirst or a desperate ache to be made right with God. If that's you, then you are blessed. Max Licardo wrote about this passage. Um, he said, 
Jesus is saying, you're blessed if you're thirsty and hungry, not thirsty for fame, possessions, passions, or romance. And how many of you know that sometimes we can come to God, not really for God, but because we're looking for all those things, fame, possession, passion, and romance. But he's talking about people who are just coming to God for God. And he says, we've drunk from those pools before. They are salt water in the desert. Now that's really interesting because if you're dehydrated, if you drink salt water, it makes you even more dehydrated. So if you're dying because you're dehydrated and you drink salt water, Max Ricardo says, these salt water pools, they don't quench thirst, they kill. It's interesting because God has created each one of us with a hunger and thirst that would point us back to him, that would cause us to come to him for satisfaction as, because he is our source. But sometimes when we have that hunger and thirst for something more, we as human beings might turn to the, what the world offers and we might even turn to sin. But what we're doing then is we're looking to salt water pools that leave us worse off and more thirsty and more dehydrated than ever before. So they don't quench our thirst, they kill. If you think about it, if someone has an addiction to, for example, pornography, it doesn't quench their thirst. It doesn't make you satisfied. You will, we will always be like, I want more, I want more, I want more. Or if someone has um, a substance addiction, they're never going to have a, a high of taking heroin and be like, oh, that's the best high I've ever had. Now I'm satisfied. It doesn't work like that. It leaves us wanting more and more and more. Meanwhile, not actually satisfying us and leaving us more empty and broken than before. And so God, in this beatitude, he has a promise for us. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Remember, not, not people who know, believe they're righteous, not people who feel like they've got everything figured out, people who know we've messed up and we're coming to Jesus and we hunger and thirst for righteousness. And then the promise is, for they shall be filled. Amen. Turn to your name and say, for you shall be filled. Jesus promises us satisfaction. Even the message version says it in a very interesting way. It says, you're blessed when you've worked up a good appetite for God. He's food and drink in the best meal you'll ever have. And the amazing thing about Jesus is the more we get to know him, the more he can redeem our appetites. Sometimes we, we're believers and we're still having appetites for the things of this world. And our appetites have got corrupted. But the more we walk with Jesus, the more we spend time with him, he over time redeems our appetites so that we long more for him than the things of this world. So my question today is, are you hungry and thirsty for God? Do you have a deep desire to be made right with him? If you do, then you're blessed because God promises you, you will be filled. He doesn't, God never sees a hungry and thirsty person and just pass by them, swipe left and go next. He, God sees a hungry and thirsty person and he looks forward, leans forward and says, I'm coming to you. You will be filled. So how can our God satisfy that deep desire we may have to be made right with him even though we're imperfect and we make mistakes, he does it through his son. So first point today was blessed are the hungry and the thirsty. And point two is Jesus gave us his righteousness. We cannot be in right standing with God through our own efforts. We can't be good enough to finally be considered um, righteous. Righteousness is a gift. It's a gift from Jesus. 
It's, it's his gift. And even as I say this, maybe, maybe you're thinking, I know that. Or maybe you're saying, I've been a Christian for 20 years. I know that. I've heard it my whole life. But even if that's the case, do we live like that? So many of us live like we believe God is mad at us, that we're carrying shame, and we feel like when we're messed up, we're not welcome in his presence. But that's not what Jesus died for. God has so much more for us. He wants to set us free so that we can actually enjoy the gift of his righteousness and not walk around feeling bad and guilty all day. Apostle Paul wrote about this gift of righteousness in his letter to the Christians in ancient Rome. So let's read in Romans 4, verse 5 to 6. It says, But to him who does not work, that means the person who's not trying to earn their salvation, not trying to earn right standing with God, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, that's Jesus, his faith is accounted for righteousness. Just as David also describes the blessedness, there's that word again, being blessed, of the person to whom God imputes righteousness apart from works. Okay, there's some significant words in that one, accounted, imputed. I think Paul was trying to use a metaphor to help us to truly understand the legal side of righteousness. Imputed basically means, (laughs) in that way, balancing your account. So if we read verse 6 again, it would go like this. The blessedness of the man to whom God balances their account of righteousness despite their works. So what happened at the cross um, is that Jesus, when Jesus died on the cross, our sin, our debt was placed on Jesus. Our sin, our past, present, and future sin was placed on Jesus. That's why 2 Corinthians 5 says, For he made him who knew no sin, so Jesus who was perfect, to become sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God. So basically, he took our debt and he gave us his credit. He balanced our account of righteousness. Another term you can say is imputed righteousness. We receive this righteousness from Christ at the moment of salvation. At the moment we recognize that Jesus is God and we tell that to him and we invite him to be the Lord or the authority over our life. That moment we now have imputed righteousness and right standing with God. But some of us may struggle with that because how can we go from unrighteous to righteous through one simple prayer that like doesn't seem right? It's, it's hard to believe. Um, but this week in the Bible reading plan we're doing as a church, and if you're not on the Bible reading plan and you would like to be, please connect with reception. But there was a, a, a story that really illustrates this point. And just a warning, if you don't like reptiles, specifically snakes, you may want to look away. Okay. Um, But there was a story in Numbers where the Israelites were walking through the wilderness and they rebelled against God. And these snakes, there was an attack of snakes against them. And the snakes were biting them and they were dying because they were poisonous. The Israelites were dying. And even in that moment where they had really messed up, God provided a way for them to be saved. So he told Moses to build a sculpture out of bronze with a snake on a pole. And God said, if anyone so much as just looked at that pole, they would be saved from death. And It does not make logical sense, does it? Like, how could me just looking save my life? And I wonder if some people didn't even do it, maybe because they were like, 
well, that's not going to help me. How could I, why, what's the point? That simple looking up was an act of faith being like, it does not make sense, but I'm just going to trust God that he said, do this. And he's going to save my life. And then later in the New Testament, the disciple John wrote about this in John 3. And he said, and as Moses lifted up that serpent in the wilderness, even so the son of man, Jesus, must be lifted up on the cross that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. So at the point of salvation, of looking to Jesus, your life is saved and you have right standing with God. We just need to receive this gift by receiving Jesus, by looking up. Amen. So blessed are the hungry and thirsty because God gave, Jesus gave us his righteousness that belonged to him. And we need to, point three, receive the gift of righteousness. I get the sense today, just uh, as I was preparing, that many are standing before the Lord and just so conscious of how unworthy you feel. Um, maybe you've been walking in rebellion against the Lord, or maybe you're just conscious of your mistakes. And I just saw like just looking down and ashamed. And it reminds me of some another story in Zechariah 3 about Joshua. And there's many Joshua's in Scripture. There's the Joshua who led the Israelites into the promised land. But there's also the Joshua who was the high priest of the nation. And there was a prophetic picture of him in Zechariah 3 that let's just read this. And, and as you do, just take note of how the Lord responds in the middle of Joshua and Israel's condemnation and shame. How does God respond? Then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right hand to oppose him. And some people in here or online have been standing before the Lord and Satan has been accusing you in your mind, just even in worship, telling you how not good enough you are and how far you've fallen. But then look, look what he does. And the Lord said to Satan, the Lord rebuke you, Satan, the Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. And I feel like the Lord wants to tell some people today, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. I've chosen this son. I've chosen this daughter. And then look what he does with the dirty robes. That's symbolizing sin, sinful acts. So then he answered and spoke to those who stood for him saying, take away the filthy garments from him. And to him, he said, see, I have removed your iniquity from you and I will clothe you with rich robes. Those rich robes, if you look throughout scripture, there's so many examples of robes and it representing the robe of righteousness as a symbol of righteousness. God wants to take away our filthy robes and clothe us in his righteousness. And that's what he did on the cross. Um, some here may feel like you're not standing before Jesus in dirty clothes. Maybe you feel so exposed. Maybe everybody knows what you did. And maybe you feel even naked before the Lord and the community. And the Lord reminded me of an, how the man in Mark 5 came to Jesus. He was, he, he was out of my, his mind. He was running around naked and cutting himself. But he saw Jesus from afar and he ran to him. And God restored his mind, but also restored his dignity and clothed him. Whenever we come to Jesus, sometimes we, we hold back because we're like, oh, I'm too dirty or I've messed up. I can't go to him. I don't want to be exposed. But in our exposure, God never embarrasses us. When we come before him, he's like, I'll clothe you in mine. You're covered. He puts his righteousness on us. So today we've got more to talk through, but before we move on, I would just like to give an opportunity for prayer. 
So if you're here today and you realize that um, you've never actually accepted Jesus to be Lord over your life and you want to have Jesus as your Lord and Savior and receive his righteousness, then please pray this prayer after me. Let's just close our eyes. And if that's you, just pray this prayer. Like the Israelites looking up at the pole, let's look to Jesus. Um, Father God, thank you that you love me and that you want me as a part of your family. I believe that Jesus died and that he rose again. I recognize that I am a sinner and I have been disobedient to you. Today I come to you and I repent and I invite you, Jesus, to be my Lord and my final authority in my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Welcome to the family for those who prayed that prayer. If you prayed that prayer, um, can I just encourage you afterwards, there's going to be an opportunity to come forward for the ministry team to pray for you. But also, if, if you don't, then please, when you go home, share with a loved one what you prayed. But then I'd also like to give an opportunity to maybe to pray. Maybe you know the Lord. Maybe you've known the Lord your whole life. Like Joshua, he knew the Lord. He'd grown up in a community that loved the Lord, but he was standing before the Lord in dirty robes. And maybe you feel like that today. I just would like to give you an opportunity to repent so that you can experience just the freedom of being made righteous before the Lord. So if that's you, let's just all close our eyes again and pray, pray, pray. Father God, I come before you today. I know I've been disobedient to you. Please forgive me. Thank you that you are merciful. Would you take away my filthy garments and clothe me in your righteousness? In Jesus' name, amen. All right. So now we've received Jesus' righteousness. What happens next? Point four today is now we walk in his righteousness. So blessed are the hungry and the thirsty. Jesus gave us his righteousness, received the gift of righteousness, and then walk in his righteousness. Often when we receive Jesus and we believe in him and we're born again and we're now Christians, so often, and I've fallen in for this many times before, um, so often we now fall for the temptation the Galatians church did, where we now and try and pay back to Jesus the debt he paid. We try and earn, earn our salvation even though it's been given to us. Romans 4 talks about this. Let's read it together. Romans 4 verse 4. Um, now to him who works, that means the person who's trying to earn their right standing with God, their wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. But to him who does not work, so the person who's not trying to earn righteousness, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. And so can I just actually speak to the parents today quickly? Parents, so many of the youth and the children that I speak to genuinely believe when we ask them, how do you get saved? They believe they get saved through living a good life. And so I just ask you to emphasize to your children that that's not the case. Living a good life, living right is important, but that's not how we come to Jesus. We get a free gift by believing in him. And that's how we are saved, by making him Lord over our life. So please, parents, can you please make that clear to your children? Because so many of them really don't understand. And um, yeah, so please, can you do that? Because 
Galatians 3 verse 1, Paul wrote to the the Galatians, and um, I think he must have been frustrated because he's very harsh. So I did not write this. I'm just reminding you, it's Paul. (laughs) He says, oh, foolish Galatians, this one thing I want to learn from you. Did you receive the spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? And sometimes that would be what God says to us. Hey guys, did you get saved because you were living perfectly or because you believed God's word to you and he saved you? Having, are you so foolish? Having begun in the spirit, are you now being made perfect in the flesh through your own works? We, Basel one, do not need to worry about the debt of our sin because Jesus already paid it. It's done. He said it is finished. And when we're trying to earn God's grace that's freely being given, we're living with a sense of debt that Jesus never wanted us to carry. You know, when you have a big, big debt and you wake up in the morning, it's heavy, isn't it? It's stressful. You're thinking about all day, how can I pay this off? How can I pay this off? You long for the day when you can wake up and that is not on your mind. And our debt of sin was too big for us to pay. So Jesus paid it. So we do not have to live with that burden anymore. But as I say that, you may now wonder, (laughs) we know that believers, they still do sinful actions after they're born again. So how does that work? On the one hand, the Bible says that we're already righteous. And then the other hand, we see ourselves and our community that they are believers and we are all still doing unrighteous acts, right? So how does that work? I think if we go back to the distinction between the two different kinds of righteousness, then it will help us understand. So if the Christian walk were to be put in a diagram, maybe it would look something like this. Okay. So at point A over there, um, God created the world and he created mankind and they were in perfect union with God. They were naked and they were unashamed. They were righteous before the Lord. And God warned them, he said, don't eat of this tree, otherwise you'll die. And God was trying to protect them from the consequences of sin. In Potter's we always say sin is damaged. The reason why God hates sin is because he loves us so passionately that he doesn't want us to experience the damage of sin and us to give that damage to others. So God warned them, don't eat of this tree because if you eat of this tree, death will enter to the world. But they were walking along with God and they had this beautiful relationship with God. And then at B, the accuser, Satan, came to them and tempted them. And they fell for it. They partook of the sin. And immediately, there was this break in their union with God. There was damage done to their relationship with God. The damage done to their relationship with each other. um, And death entered the world. So we have C. And all of us are born into this state. But Jesus was not content to have a broken relationship with mankind. So he came to pay the price, that death that was the consequence of sin, he died to take our price so that the legal requirements of the law were paid and we could have right standing with God. The moment we believe in Jesus and receive him as Lord, we are instantly made righteous before God. That's the imputed righteousness we were talking about. It's a gift. There's nothing we do except like look up like the Israelites. Jesus does that. Jesus did that for us. And D, we're instantly made righteous. Now our new life with Jesus begins. And we're walking with Jesus. And he gives us his Holy Spirit to live inside of us. 
And Romans 8 verse 29 saying, says we're being conformed to the image of his son, meaning our whole life as we walk down this process of life, God is transforming us to make us more and more like Jesus. This is what Jesus does in us and through us. It's at the relational righteousness or the imparted righteousness. This is the right relationship with God and man. That as you're walking down this path, maybe God reveals, oh, you've got a problem with gossip. So you let that go. And then the next year he says, oh, let's, let's work on that anger because you're not honoring me and you're not honoring your fellow man. So let's work on that. Oh, we need to work on how you treat your parents. You know, so this is a life time process. It takes your whole life because at Z, Jesus says, only when we meet Jesus in heaven, do we then become like him and perfect. That does not happen (laughs) until we go to heaven. But when you mess up here and you will mess up, probably every day we mess up, it does not take us back to separation from God, like Garden of Eden, because Jesus paid our debt. So when we walk along here, we are not doing righteous acts in order to be made right with God. Jesus did that for us. We are doing righteous acts because we've been made right with God. Amen? So I'd just like to share one final story with you as a worship team. Please, can you come up? This is a true story from a long, long time ago, um, back when corporal punishment was still legal all over the world. Thankfully, times have changed. But <laughs> um, Okay, so it was in, uh, in Virginia, in America. And there was a very impoverished community. And they had one schoolhouse. You know the the schoolrooms where all the grades are in one room? You know that? You've seen that? Okay. And the people in the community were, the children were really badly behaved. No teacher lasted very long. They were, it became a game to see how fast they could get rid of teachers. And um, every teacher just gave up on them and left. But there was one man, he was a Christian man. He felt led by the Lord to go to the school. And they warned him what the children were like, but he, he felt called by the Lord. And so he started his journey with them a bit differently. He asked them, guys, what are your dreams and visions? And so they said, I want a nice car, or I want to be a I want to heal people through medicine. I want to, you know, all these nice dreams and visions. And and then he started saying, yeah, well, how are you going to do that? You're going to need a job. How are you going to get a job? And they started to understand, actually, learning is really important for me getting to my dreams and visions. And so then he said, okay, but what if someone disrupts the, our learning process. We need to protect our learning process because we, we want to achieve these dreams and visions. So together as a class, they came up with some consequences. Like for example, talking in class, one lash, not doing your homework, three lashes. Then Johnny put up his hand because his mom made the best lunches out of everyone. So this was a big concern for me. He said, what are we going to do if someone steals a lunch? <laughs> and they decided six lashes. <laughs> See how important lunches were. <laughs> anyway, so as a community, they decide that. And the children start thriving. They're doing so well because they understand the value of what they're learning. Then one day... Johnny ran to the teacher and told him, teacher, someone's stolen my lunch. So the teacher called everyone in the room and they're all sitting there. And you know that awkward thing where you're like waiting as a student for someone to confess and they would just wait and wait and wait. Eventually, little boy Jimmy puts up his hand. He said, it was me. And he comes forward to get his lashes. The thing was, 
Jimmy was from the most impoverished family in the community. Jimmy hadn't eaten for three days. And he was too embarrassed to tell his teacher that. So he had stolen Johnny's lunch. And he took off his jacket to get the beating. And he didn't even have a shirt because his family couldn't afford that. So what does his teacher do now? Because they've agreed as a class on the consequences. And if, she do, if he didn't uphold the rules, then the whole learning process would be devalued. But then you're looking at this boy, Jimmy, and how do you beat such a child? <laughs> so Johnny puts up his hand again, and just before Jimmy's about to get whipped, he says, teacher, can someone else take the lashes? And the teacher says, yes. So he walks to the front, and he takes all six lashes for his own lunch that was stolen so that Jimmy didn't get beaten. And the class learned an important thing that day. The rules were important, the learning process was important, but they learned about grace. And Johnny and Jimmy were friends for life. And um, Jimmy never stole a lunch ever again. <laughs> but, That sacrifice is what like Jesus did for us. The consequences for sin were death. He took our consequence. So the legal requirements of the law were upheld. The debt was paid. We are made in right standing with God. It's done. Now, just like Johnny and Jimmy were friends and Jimmy's life changed, his behavior changed. He didn't walk in that way anymore. Now Jesus wants to walk with us in a close and intimate relationship where we become more and more like him for the rest of our lives until we meet him in eternity. Amen. Would you please stand? We're going to sing a song now um, just called Hold Me Now where let's just thank the Lord for what he did for us, that he took our penalty, our lashings, and our, our, our cross. But also, if you want a moment to meet with Jesus, and if you want prayer, the, the altar is wide open for prayer ministry. But let's just thank our God for what he did for us. Amen. <laughs>